Hi, let's talk about um, really interesting diseases that are being tracked in my state and in the Southwest, and maybe diseases um, you have never heard of before, but I think it's interesting to note that these are the top 10 diseases that are being tracked in um, Maricopa County in the state of Arizona, the Southwest of America. So of course, COVID-19 is still being tracked. Um, of course, number of cases. The next one, acute flaccid myelitis. Have you ever heard of that? Well, this disease is very similar to the effects of polio. So acute flaccid myelitis are also known as AFM. It's characterized by rapid onset of muscle weakness and um, even distinct abnormalities of the spinal gray matter can be seen on MRI. So if patients do come in with like a rapid onset of like not being able to move their limbs or they just go limp and flaccid, uh, an MRI should be done. So here in the Southwest in the beginning of the summer and fall of 2014, uh, a big increase in the amount of reports of AFM were occurring in the whole United States. So um, surveillance was established in 2015 to monitor this illness. And um, they began getting another increase of reports in 2016. And so it's helping them, and when I say them, I'll say the health department, of understanding more of the clinical features, the epidemiology, and short-term uh, short outcomes of the cases of this. So here's what providers or doctors, nurse practitioners, or whatnot um, should be aware of. Well, how do you know if a patient has AFM? Well, they'll clinically present with a fever that lasts about one to two weeks before they get the flaccid weak muscles. Um, they'll frequently say they have a history, a recent history of G or current um, GI symptoms like a gastrointestinal illness maybe occurred, um, runny nose, cough, vomiting, or diarrhea. The onset of the weakness is very rapid as far as the weakness in the limbs, whether it's legs, arms, and it can occur within a few hours to just a few days. Um, weakness is in one or more limbs and is more proximal than distal, which means it would occur, say, more in my upper arms versus my lower arms. So it, it would be a big risk of the thighs because the child or the adult would not be able to walk all of a sudden. And the coincidence would be, did they have a fever and kind of an illness right before this occurred? Other things that might be present, they're called cranial nerve abnormalities. So we would see either a facial or an eyelid droop, difficulty swallowing or speaking, and then having a chronically hoarse voice or a weak cry. So think of that especially in a child, if their voice is very hoarse or when they're crying and it's it doesn't sound like their normal robust cry, they're not eating well because they're all limp. I mean, obviously all those things are very urgent. Um, Older patients would complain about stiff neck, headache, or pain in the affected limbs. So um, if they have like the leg weakness, a lot of patients report extreme pain there. And I know um, there was a child uh, that I know of that had this illness and she was telling me like they couldn't manage her pain in the hospital. So I thought that was really interesting because I don't exactly know what was going on, what they were trying for her pain. Um, and I remember her telling me they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. It really sounds like AFM. Patients can also complain of numbness or tingling. Um, in worst cases, they can actually go through respiratory failure, so they need to be put on a ventilator. Do you see how this sounds like polio? It's not polio, but it's this. Um, ser now, maybe a cousin, very similar. Um, serious neurologic complications such as body temperature changes, blood pressure changes, these are things that can be life-threatening and that's why this can progress to an emergency. So AFM can res resemble other illnesses. We call these making a list of differential diagnoses. And so that would be things like synovitis, neuritis, limb injury, Guillain-Barre syndrome, transverse myelitis, stroke, a tumor, acute cord compression, and conversion disorder. Um, AFM should be very high on your differential diagnosis list if you're in the late summer or early fall. That's when we see more of the cases of this, um, especially in those patients that have just complained of a virus and now they have these.
So again, um, a careful neuro exam, an MRI, and some lab testing. MRI of the, uh, the spine and the brain, of course, can help guide the diagnosis. So, okay, so that is a very important disease uh, being monitored. Let's move to the next one. And we will talk now about, um, of course, influenza. We're always tracking that. Foodborne illnesses, extreme heat, especially in the Southwest. Um, let's talk about enterovirus D68. So what is that? Well, patients will usually have, again, fever, runny nose, sneezing, coughing, um, body and muscle aches. Uh, severe symptoms can be wheezing, difficulty breathing. The diagnosis of this can only be done with a specific lab test on specimen from the person's nose or throat. Some hospitals and doctor's offices can test ill patients to see if they have an enterovirus infection. However, most cannot do specific testing to determine the type of enterovirus like EVD68. And currently, Arizona does not have the capability to test for EVD68. All lab samples should be sent to the CDC for analysis, since we don't have the ability in Arizona to do that. Only CDC labs can confirm whether a sample from Arizona has the D68 strain. So let's go through um, the fact sheet and the school and child care guidance on this one and why it's so important. So enterovirus D68 is not new. It was first isolated in 1962, but it was rarely reported since then. Um, enteroviruses of all various types can um, account for about 10 to 15 million infections each year in the United States, uh, usually in the late summer or fall. Um, the latest outbreak really did mostly involve children. And of course, we went over the symptoms, the fever, runny nose, sneezing, cough, body and muscle aches, wheezing, difficulty breathing. And so um, how do we treat them? Well, the vast majority of children that have EVD68 have mild symptoms and do not need any medical care beyond what you would do for the common cold. So of course, you know, your doctor may say what to do. I, as a natural doctor, would tell my patients a lot of different things. So a number of children with asthma and even some without a prior history of wheezing have had unusually severe cases of EVD68 resulting in hospitalization and some even requiring the ICU. So children with a high fever, so what's a high fever? Above 103, and those with cold symptoms lasting longer than seven to 10 days should talk with their pediatrician. Now, when I say high fever, that's different from an infant, especially if they're younger than ten, uh, two months. If a baby uh, less than two months old has a fever of 100.4 or higher, that is considered an emergency, you would go to the uh, ER. You know, once it, they're greater than two months of age, Usually your pediatrician is on call or they have an on-call service. Anytime your young baby has a fever, you want to call into that on-call service so they can go through a list of questions to make sure you don't need to go into the hospital, that it can wait for a doctor's visit the next day. But generally, I'm talking grade school, middle school age children here when I say high fever 103 or higher. So um, if your child has a history of asthma or other respiratory illnesses, this may be more serious for them. And so, um, you know, regular medicine recommends, you know, keeping your rescue medication with you, like your, um, you know, asthma inhaler with you. General medicine, traditional standard Western medicine recommends the flu vaccine. Of course, your integrative doctor might have some more ideas. And then what can you do to avoid this? Well, you can wash your hands often, of course, for 20 seconds or more. Try avoid touching your nose, mouth, and eyes. I always try to avoid touching my face. Just now I had an itch and I had to do that. But in general, I try not to touch my face because of course your hands always have germs on them. Um, and then, uh, well, let's see what, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm not a big fan of wearing masks all the time. I think that has really damaged our children. And I think people are more likely to get other infections like fungal infections around the nose and mouth because of that, that, that dome, the mask creates this moist, almost like a jungle environment on the face, which is really um, causing some infections and fungal infections and even impetigo on the face. So I'm not a huge fan of masking just to mask. Um, I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's part of the human experience. 
I get it, we did it for COVID, but you need to know the regular traditional masks are not stopping any virus. A virus can get right through that material. Only the N95 mask, if properly fitted, it comes in small, medium, large, if properly fitted, where you puff out air and you don't feel the air coming out, that's a proper fitting mask. All these other masks are security theater. It's just a show. And for some, it's a virtue signal. I mean, let's be honest. It's not protecting you from the virus. Will it protect you from a glob of mucus flying out of someone's nose if they sneeze? Yeah, it, it'll do that. So if someone is like sneezing copious amounts of mucus, please put a mask on. But if you're just walking around a mask thinking you're safer, I need to break it to you. You're not, okay? This is someone who has taken microbiology, virology, nursing school, medical school. I'm telling you, paper masks are not gonna do you any good. Okay. Um, and then, of course, disinfect frequently touched surfaces like toys, doorknobs, etc. Okay, so that is that illness. Um, there's more uh, information on enterovirus D68 on the website stopthespreadaz.org. Again, that's specific to Arizona. So what else are we tracking? We're tracking hepatitis A. That's been around forever. It's usually a foodborne illness when, I mean, for the most case, um, you know, say you go to a restaurant, they're going to the bathroom, they're not washing the hands, they're preparing your food. Well, that's a great way to get hepatitis A. I mean, let's be honest. We're tracking measles, mumps, swimmer's itch. Let's talk about swimmer's itch. So swimmer's itch is also known as circarial dermatitis. And it's a skin rash caused by an allergic reaction to certain microscopic parasites that infect birds and mammals. So these parasites are then released into fresh and salt water, such as lakes, ponds, oceans, and sometimes even water parks and backyard pools. While the parasite's preferred host is the specific bird or animal, mammal, if the parasite comes into contact with a swimmer, it burrows into the skin, causing an allergic reaction and rash. Swimmer's itch is found throughout the world and is more frequent during the summer months. <laughs> Doesn't that just sound lovely? So if you have a swimming pool, make sure you're testing the water frequently and you're keeping it chlorinated as it should be. Um, I don't know, I I've had people get, um, you know, the folliculitis you get from the whirlpools or the spa jacuzzis at the gym when they're not chlorinated properly or someone was leaning against that and had an infection and then I end up uh, with a patient with folliculitis. That's different than swimmer's itch. Folliculitis, you'll see the irritation around each hair follicle and it is a form of an infection and it needs to be treated. But with swimmer's itch, you'll have a tingling, burning, and an itching of the skin because yeah, you have the mite, you have the parasite that burrowed in there small reddish looking pimples in the area and maybe small blisters. So that is something we do track. Um, let's look at the CDC Swimmer's Itch Frequent Question page. So we talked about how it gets in the water. Um, if the, oh, here's something interesting. If the eggs um, from the birds or mammals land in the water. The eggs hatch, releasing small, free-swimming microscopic larvae. These larvae swim in the water in search of a certain species of the aquatic snail. If the larvae find one of these snails, they infect the snail, multiply, etc. Then the snails release the larvae into the water, and then this larvae swims searching for a bird or a muskrat or a mammal to continue the life cycle. And humans are not the suitable hosts, but they can become a host. So the liver larvae comes in contact in the water, burrows into the skin. They think you're a muskrat. They don't know you're human, but they're gonna try it anyway. And then the patient dies of, uh, not dies, the person ends up with the allergic reaction and the rash. Um, now, because these larvae cannot develop inside a human, they will soon die. So this is a self-limiting rash, but it can be very uncomfortable. Uh, uncomfortable. Who wants to walk around with a big itchy rash? So it may be that, it, you know, because a lot of people will point to something and say, oh, that's just a heat rash. Well, always ask a patient, have you been in a lake, a pond, swimming in an untreated water park or pool, blah, blah, blah. Or yeah somewhere where a snail would have been in. But I've seen some gross pools where definitely there could be some snails. Um, do you need to see a doctor for treatment? 
Well, you know, the good news is most cases of swimmer's itch rash do not require medical attention. You could try an over-the-counter corticosteroid cream. Um, you could apply cool, apply cool compresses to the area. You could sit in a bath with Epsom salt and bake or baking soda or, you know, um, you could even soak in a colloidal oatmeal bath. Um, you could use a baking soda paste. So you make that by taking the baking soda water, you stir it and you create a paste, and then you smooth it on the area. I would let it sit a while, you're watching TV or a movie, and then go in the shower and rinse it off. Or you could use an anti-itch lotion. There's a million of them out there, like calamine lotion, stuff like that. Uh, can swimmers itch spread from person to person? Nope. That's a good, <laughs> good news. Um, who is at risk? Well, anyone who swims in infested water is at risk. Um, and then children are most often affected because they tend to swim, wade, play in shallow water more than adults, and they are less likely to towel dry themselves when leaving the water. So I guess it's a good idea to vigorously dry your children when they're done with the water, but then I would probably throw that right into the, the washer. Um, is it safe to swim in my swimming pool? Well, the CDC says yes, as long as your swimming pool is maintained and chlorinated. Well, that's what I just said. Um, snails must be present. Again, I've seen some scary swimming pools. So how to avoid it? Don't swim in marshy areas where snails are commonly found. Don't swim in areas where swimmers itch is a known problem. Shower immediately after leaving the water. Towel dry. Don't attract birds by feeding them, especially in areas where people are swimming. So that's all I have about that. Isn't that interesting? Good to know as spring and summer are just around the corner. What else are we tracking? We're tracking salmonellosis, which again is usually from food poisoning. We track valley fever. So here in Arizona, we deal with valley fever. I know in the Midwest, um, <coughs> the Ohio Valley, Illinois and whatnot, they deal with um, the bat droppings from a different type of uh, fungal infection that's not valley fever. But um, it, it's from the dropping of bats where in here it's in our desert soil and we breathe in the spores and we end up with, they're called fungus balls, they're actually called that. And they show up on x-ray. Uh, let's see, and then of course we're tracking HIV of course and STDs. Um, tuberculosis. Let's look at this. Zoonotic diseases. What are the rare zoonotics that we're tracking? Oh, okay. So we are still tracking because in Arizona, we do have marshy areas. So we do get Zika virus, chikungunya, dengue, West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis. These are all mosquito and vector-borne diseases. We do track them in case they're outbreaks. And then you see on the news, we have all these truck spraying areas. Um, Animal-related disease, because we have a big coyote population here in the Southwest. Um, leptospirosis, rabies, and salmonella, also known as pocket pets. And then, um, well, let's look into that a little bit. Let's look into the leptospirosis, because I have to refresh myself on that. So this is a bacterial disease. It's on the rise in Arizona. Uh, it's spread through the urine of infected animals. That includes coyotes, rats. We have roof rats here in Scottsdale and Phoenix because there's so much citrus here that falls in the ground. People don't pick it up and the rats love it. We call them roof rats because we don't have a subway or uh, a system like that. <coughs> and our canals, um, they're all open air. So the rats love to go from rooftop to rooftop, getting the citrus and biting through people's car wires and ruining air conditionings and stuff like that. So it's a thing in Arizona. Um, it can be spread through um, other wildlife pets and live, livestock as well. So if your dog um, is infected through contact with an infected animal um, or their water or wet soil, that, that other, say coyote, urinated in their yard or whatever, um, they can spread to the dogs. Dogs with this can potentially spread this to people and those that work with animals are at increased risk for infection. Dogs with leptospirosis can shed the bacteria in their urine for up to several months, even if they don't have symptoms. So what are the symptoms in dogs? So you can look out for this so it doesn't spread to you. Fever, lack of energy or lethargy, lack of appetite, red eyes, vomiting, diarrhea, 
Uh, signs of kidney or liver damage, which can include frequent urination, excessive drinking, yellow eyes and skin, decreased urination, or abdominal pain. Um, some dogs will not show any of these, and they'll just have a mild illness. Um, leptospirosis infection can be fatal or result in permanent kidney or liver damage. And that's why if your dog has any of these, take them to the vet and say, could they have leptospirosis? So prevention, avoid swimming or wading in water that could be contaminated with animal urine, drinking this uh, contaminated water. This includes unchlorinated water at dog parks, parks, daycare, and boarding facilities for dogs. Avoid content, contact with rodents. Of course, I don't want to pet a roof rat. <coughs> um, avoid urine contaminated soil, water, grass, food, or bedding from infected animals such as wildlife, farm animals, other dogs. There is a vaccine for leptospirosis. It can help um, prevent infection and disease. You get it through the veterinarian for your dog. Okay, so that is something we track in Arizona. Let's see where we are here. Have we gone through? Oh, yeah, I think the video is long enough. So those are the big ones that we're tracking in Arizona in the Southwest. Um, if we're tracking it here in Arizona, believe me, it's happening in Southern California and New Mexico as well. We have very similar wildlife uh, and very similar climate because there is a big desert region of Southern California as well as New Mexico and even up into Utah. So this does extend outwards. I hope that was helpful, um, especially to those of you in healthcare, and even if you're not in healthcare. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you on the next one.